I think there are two parts of this that are deeply concerning. One, of course, is the security part. But the other is, like, what can they practically do with this, right? It's 44,000 hours of footage. There's a lot in there. Can they actively establish a counter narrative, a visual counter narrative that will go against what the January 6th committee has presented to the American public? I mean, do you think that's possible? Not in any complete way. But remember, what we see from these Republicans in the current investigations, you know, I'm on the Oversight Committee, I'm yeah. on the subcommittee You're on the committee on the to the weaponization. weaponization of the federal government. Right. And what they are trying to accomplish, and they did this a little bit with the impeachment investigation, is a 30-second soundbite yeah. that can be then used and spun a web to create an alternative universe. So is it possible that they could cherry pick 30 seconds of video and use that as the basis for a completely fictional narrative? Yes, of course, because it's what they do every day. So the possibilities for someone like Tucker Carlson, uh, who has no relationship with the truth, is to p cherry pick various portions of it, try to weave it together to create a false narrative that can then go through the right wing ecosphere. Joining us now is Benny Thompson, the Democratic congressman from Mississippi and former chairman of the January 6th committee. Congressman, thank you for making time to be here. We really appreciate it. And I just would love to get your first thoughts and the reaction from inside the Democratic caucus about the decision on the part of the Speaker of the House. Well, thank you very much for having me, Alex. Let me just say that the Democratic caucus in its entirety was absolutely flabbergasted that the speaker would make 44,000 hours of video available uh, to any news media without any standards, any protocols, or any notification of leader Jeffries or House administration or anybody. Uh, Democrats, just like others, heard about it in the press. So that's not how you do it. We put ourselves uh, at risk as a country, as congresspersons in the Capitol. There were a number of items that our committee put together as we viewed all of this material. Uh, we set up a separate uh, section to be viewed by individuals who had been cleared. Each one had a password to look. We worked out with the Capitol Police to make sure that we did not compromise security at any point. It's clear now, as far as we know, there's the possibility of security risk because cameras are located in a lot of areas. As you know, a lot of us had to be marshaled out of the Capitol uh, during the insurrection, uh, all of that is on footage, and and it compromises the integrity and security of the Capitol. Uh, I think Speaker McCarthy has some explaining to do, uh, quite honestly. I mean, it's it's awfully strange behavior from a party that purports to be the party of law and order to directly compromise the safety of those who are charged with keeping everyone safe. Um, I. I I wonder if you think that this is part of the bargain that Speaker McCarthy made to the right wing members of his caucus who were publicly asking for this footage to be released in advance of the speaker's election. Do you think this is part of the devil's bargain he made in early January? Oh, there's no question about it. I, I think we'll see some other things uh, over time also that says in order for him to get uh, the speakership, uh, he had to give up everything. And as you know, Fox news was one of the major networks uh, promoting the big lie. Uh, it's coming out in the Dominion voting case that they knew specifically that the election had not been stolen, but they kept repeating the big lie. And so now you give the footage to the big lie station so they can do the damage that they have been talking about all the time. Look, the men and women who protected us, Alex, uh, they did a yeoman's job. Uh, over 150 uh, were absolutely hurt. Some are still off work. Uh, some lost their lives. 
and the men and women who work in the Capitol every day deserve the best security possible. By giving this video to Fox uh, News or Network or Tucker Carlson or whomever is clearly a dereliction of duty of the speaker. And at some point, uh, I hope nothing happens, but he needs to be made accountable for what is clearly something that puts the security of the United States Capitol at risk. There's also just the, re I mean, beyond the security concerns, which are grave, there's also the idea that the Speaker of the House is willingly handing over government footage to, I don't, I, I mean, I don't even want to use the word news to describe what Fox is, but a, a propaganda machine, effectively, and what precedent that sets. I mean, are, should other outlets now request this footage too? Does is that I mean is that the way to combat? That? I mean, how do, what what is, what is your suggestion to people in the media here? Well, well, uh, first of all, uh, we set protocols in place to look at the footage. We worked it out with the Capitol Police. We did it in a manner uh, that would not compromise security at all. My understanding is the Capitol Police didn't know that the footage had been released or made available to Fox until they read about it uh, in the press. That is not how you uh, do a security-related issue. Uh, the chief of the Capitol Police is a qualified individual. We worked with him. Uh, it was a good relationship between our committee and, and the Capitol Police. And to my knowledge, we never had a single breach of that protocol while we had the film in our custody. When Putin sees he can gain an inch, he's apt to, apt to take a mile. And basically, if America is not going to give him any pushback, I think he's going to continue to try to expand Russian influence. If we had a, a policy which was firm, which armed Ukraine with defensive and offensive weapons so that they could defend themselves, I think Putin would make different calculations. If you had a Reagan-esque policy of, of strength, um, I think you'd see people like Putin not want to mess with us. That was how Ron DeSantis used to talk about Russia and Ukraine. During Russia's 2014 invasion of Crimea, DeSantis was still a member of Congress sitting on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And he used his position at the time to do what most Republicans did back then, which was stake out hawkish positions against Russian aggression and blame the Obama White House for not being strong enough to be for being weak and not doing enough to arm Ukrainians in that fight. But that was then. And now Ron DeSantis is a potential contender in the Republican nomination for president. He is running in a party whose base has all but embraced Vladimir Putin and abandoned its support for Ukraine. So now when Ron DeSantis gets asked about Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine, he says things like this. I don't think it's in our interest to be getting into proxy war with China getting involved uh, over things like the borderlands or, or over Crimea. The fear of kind of Russia going into NATO countries and all that and steamrolling, you know, that has not even come close to happening. DeSantis's evolution on the issue is part of a growing trend within the Republican Party. While some in the GOP have maintained support for Ukraine, there is growing momentum among conservatives who have begun openly advocating to abandon Ukraine in this fight. Congressman Matt Gates has introduced a resolution that would end all military and financial aid to Ukraine. Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is now an ally of House Republican leadership, she has called for Biden's impeachment over his visit to Ukraine earlier this week. And yesterday, Donald Trump released a video for his supporters claiming that World War III has never been closer than it is right now and vowing to clean the house of all the warmongers and America last globalists in the deep state, the Pentagon, the State Department and the National Security Industrial Complex. Joining us now is Julia Yaffe, Washington correspondent and founding partner at Puck News. Julia, it's great to see you. Um, Hi, good to see you, Alex. So my question is how the evolution of the GOP on the, you, 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 the fight 
uh, in Ukraine. It, there was a moment, and it was a short-lived moment, when there seemed to be some version of bipartisan support for this at the outset of all of it. And I wonder what you think the catalyst for the, the chilled enthusiasm, uh, which is putting it mildly, inside the GOP, what the catalyst was for that? Was it just, the, is it the length of the war? Is it the fact that Biden seems to be somewhat successful in his strategy? Is it just isolation? Isolationism is an inevitable end point of the modern day GOP? I mean, what do you attribute it to? I think it's important to point out that I think it's still a mainstream position in the Republican Party to support Ukraine. And I was just at the Munich Security Conference, and there were a lot of Republicans, both senators and House members from the Republican side of the aisle who were there pledging their support, some of them pretty high-ranking members pledging to, quote, die on this hill because they it because it reminded them of the struggle of World War II, that it was such a clean-cut battle of good versus evil. As for what's happening on the far right wing of the party, I think it has several, several explanations. One is the kind of as American as apple pie isolationism that runs strong in American politics from the very beginning of our republic. Part of it is Trump's embrace of Russia and the fact that Russia during his administration was seen more as a friend, in part because Russia tried to help him win the election and definitely put, the th put their thumb on the scale during the 2016 presidential election. Uh, Putin also very ably inserts himself into our culture wars. Even on uh, yesterday, when he spoke, when he delivered his address to the Federal Assembly, he again invoked a lot of our culture war issues. Uh, and, and, and I think part of it is done to insert himself into the American culture wars, talking about how the war is being waged so that kids don't have a parent number one and a parent number two, but so that they have a mother and a father. And so that Ukrainians can't push queer values onto Christian Russia. I think that really resonates with Republicans, I think, especially on the far right. I think what's interesting is that on this part of the far right, they're very uncomfortable taking the fight to Vladimir Putin, mm. in part because he's mm. a white nationalist Christian leader in their eyes. But they're very comfortable taking the fight to China. And I, Let me, you know, and I wonder what the difference is. I, and I, I hear which is, I mean, and there's no question that there are some establishment figures inside the GOP that are very much publicly voicing their support for Ukraine. But, you know, if you look at Republican support for providing weapons for Ukraine, for example, in May of last year, 53 percent of Republicans wanted to provide that support. January of this year, that's shrunk to 39 percent. So it seems like all, for all the reasons you outlined, this sort of semi-pro-Putin rhetoric is really having its effect on the grassroots part of the base. And I wonder, Putin's very shrewd operator. The fact that he's taking a page from the culture war playbook is is the way you, you know, maintain that support with the far right wing of the Republican Party. What is Zelensky's play in all of this? Because he certainly can't come out as a woke liberal um, and, and isn't when and should he and he should not have to. But I mean, how do you combat that if that's what Putin's trying to do? Because they both have to care at this point a lot about American domestic politics because it could determine in some part the future of this war. Well, I think that's why you saw Zelensky coming to Congress in late December and saying, this isn't charity. And I can account for what you have sent us. And what you are sending us is helping us win this fight. And it's keeping the fight on our lands and not bringing the, the war to you. I mean, it, the, this constant, uh, the constant lobbying, both public and private, that Ukrainians are doing is very important because you're right. This... This uh, erosion of support in the Republican base is very concerning. Pretty much everybody quoted this poll at the Munich Security Conference in, in private, and Europeans were very worried about it, and Americans had to go out of their way to reassure our European allies, because unfortunately, as much as Europe is committed to this fight, they really still need America to lead them and to unify them, to kind of herd their cats, as it were. And um, everybody is very worried on the other side of the Atlantic. What happens if Joe Biden isn't reelected? What happens if the uh, congressional makeup changes yet again? 
and the people on the far right gain more power, or if people um, in the American public turn actively hostile against Ukraine. I think right now, if it's if it's an issue that's still kind of people are basically support Ukraine but don't really pay a ton of attention to it, it shouldn't be too hard to get aid through. Maybe not in the same massive quantities that the Biden administration was able to get it through in the first year. But it is going to be a lot harder, and it's definitely something that the Biden administration is conveying to their Ukrainian counterparts, that the aid packages are just not going to be the size that they were in uh, 2022. The, the domestic politics have a massive effect on what is playing out in Ukraine, and we are all watching them carefully. Julia Yaffe, my friend, it's good to see you. Thanks for your time tonight. The AR-15 has been the quintessential piece of Americana for over six decades. And this bill would recognize its most common configuration as our country's national gun. Why is that important? Because the Second Amendment is an American, is as American a right as freedom of speech, our religion, or even the press. Father, we need to send a message to the American public that weakening the Second Amendment will likely increase the other rights will be taken as well. The era 15 has been a quintessential piece of Americana. It certainly has. No notes for Alabama Congressman Barry Moore on that front. Just take a look at this map. It shows mass shootings in America dating back nearly 11 years, all involving AR-15 rifles. This isn't even a complete list, largely because there have been so many mass shootings involving AR-15s that a complete list would make it kind of difficult to actually see the map. According, according to the gun national, sorry, according to the gun violence archive, AR-15 rifles have been the gun of choice in about 150 shootings in the past 365 days alone. So yes, the AR-15 rifle has become a quintessential, albeit horrific, play, piece of our uniquely American story. But Congressman Barry Moore's point was not that we should loosen the death grip that the AR-15 has on our culture. Congressman Moore wants to tighten the grip. Yesterday, Congressman Moore visited a gun shop in Troy, Alabama, to essentially pledge allegiance to the rifle of the United States of America. He revealed a new bill he is proposing that would make the AR-15 the national gun of America. You heard that correctly. The House of Representatives has not yet received the entire text of that bill, but who knows? It may end up winning support from certain current Republican members. Earlier this month, just ahead of the State of the Union, certain House Republicans began wearing assault rifle lapel pins, sort of like American flag pins that are worn as a show of patriotism. Among House Republicans proudly sporting the pin was embattled Congressman George Santos, who, by the way, actually co-sponsored this National Gun of America bill with Congressman Barry Moore. Georgia Congressman Andrew Clyde says he's the one who handed out the rifle pins to his Republican colleagues just days after a series of mass shootings in California that left more than a dozen people dead and several others critically wounded. Those mass shootings prompted another round of congressional debates about firearm restrictions. Clyde said he doled out the pins to remind people of the Second Amendment and of the Constitution and how important it is in preserving our liberties, though it is unclear if the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are prioritized in his list of liberties. Now, you should know that Congressman Clyde also makes millions of dollars selling military-style rifles, body armor, and ammunition at his gun store in Athens, Georgia. So it's possible that he has more at stake in the debate over gun reform than just the preservation of liberties. As to whether Congressman Moore's bill to make the AR-15 the national gun of America will pass a divided Congress, well, your, your guess on that is as good as mine. But the real question is, does it even need to? Do we need a piece of legislation to tell us that the AR-15 is the national gun of America? Nearly every mass shooting in this country shows us that it already is. And there is almost nothing that Congress has done so far that will change that.